Security controls are organized ways of combating risk. There are different strategies, there are different techniques that are coordinated and then implemented to combat risk either before, during, or after an attack. Now this could be, these strategies could be in response to different types of threats, internal, external threats, environmental, or man-made threats. So these could be hacking attempts, external man-made threats. They could be uh, a fire in your data center. It could be combated with a security control. That could be an internal environmental threat. Normally, these security controls are organized and codified in some way, usually in a set of either policies or procedures. Sometimes they're codified in one unifying document. Often, they're found throughout multiple documents within an organization. So an organization would have multiple documents, usually from HR, from the cybersecurity team, from senior leadership, addressing different strategies and different postures that the organization wants to adopt. There's four main categories of security controls according to CompT, and these are the controls, the categories you're gonna to wanna to know for your CompT exam. There's managerial, operational, technical, and physical. So within these four categories, the managerial controls will provide oversight of information systems, and essentially, uh, these are at the high level. These are controls implemented by the C-level executives, your CEOs, your CFOs, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. These controls are usually designed around risk management. And oftentimes these are higher level. These usually provide guidance on the overall direction that the organization wants to take or the overall risk management strategy that an organization wants to adopt. They are often any uh, policy document that wants to discuss or codify what strategies the organization will take will be in itself a managerial control. So identifying different strategies, identifying the security controls, classifying information systems in different risk categories, either low, medium, high, sometimes critical. That's all part of a managerial control standpoint. Uh, usually the creation of policies, the, that falls under a managerial control. An operational control is a control that is people oriented. It's designed either to direct personnel direct employees on how to act or how to behave. An acceptable use policy would be an example of an operational control. Any sort of training, uh, tabletop exercises, full tests, dry runs, those are all operational controls. HR policies, HR oriented approaches, those are also operational controls and you need to have a human element to make it an operational control. So operational controls always are involved with how humans should be acting or behaving. Technical controls, these are the most common when we talk about cybersecurity. We're often talking about technical controls. These are configuring firewalls, routers, SEM devices, uh, doing any networking, uh, configuring servers, or performing vulnerability scans, things of that nature. Those are all technical controls. We are required to have some sort of hardware or software available to us to implement a technical control. So if you're working with a device uh, in a server room or if you're working with uh, some sort of network control network uh, security device, then you're probably configuring a technical control. Now physical control is any control that controls, any control that controls, any control that uh, directs individuals or prevents individuals from gaining unauthorized access to a facility or really protects a physical structure or a portion of a facility. So basically this is traditional security. If we didn't have computers, we were talking about security a couple hundred years ago, almost most of these controls, we wouldn't have technical controls, everything would be physical. We'd be talking about locks, walls, uh, we'd be controlling access through gates, bollards. We would have uh, access control vestibules or man traps. 
as they're known. And physical controls really help prevent unauthorized access. They help prevent theft. These can be these can be overt in nature. You can have fencing that's very visible. You can have guards that are visible, or they can be a little more discreet. You can have motion sensors that are deployed to detect any activity. Those are all physical controls. A good rule of thumb with a physical control is it's going to, a physical control is always going to be something that you can physically touch, like a lock or a camera or a wall. There's going to be some sort of physical gadget there that you're going to be able to get your hands on. So you know, these are all these are classifications, and this these are classifications that CompTIA uses. These four security control classifications. A lot of organizations they don't think about it in this way. They'll just they'll classify controls into maybe different control families. A lot of frameworks will do that, like the NIST framework that the federal government uses has um, multiple control families that they use. And these control families fall into categories like access control, uh, media protection, uh, physical security, information sharing. All of these are different control families that are within, that are used to classify these controls. This is just a way that CompTIA does it. So you have to memorize the key indicators of these controls for CompTIA so you can be successful on the exam. Now, we have the four main types of controls, and we also have control functions. So we have six control functions that we have to memorize as well. These control functions are preventative, detective, corrective, directive, deterrent, and compensating. And these occur, you'd have a function that would occur at different stages of an attack. So some of these are going to occur before an attack, some would occur after. So detective controls are implemented ideally before an attack, while something like a uh, corrective control will be implemented after an attack. We'll talk about that here. So preventive controls are put in place well ahead of any attack. They're put in place in preparation of any sort of uh, breach or any sort of threat. So usually you would conduct some threat analysis. You would identify possibly the threats affecting your organization or that could potentially affect your organization. And then you would develop preventive controls to help uh, pre mitigate those threats. Technical, a technical preventive control would be something like a firewall. A physical preventive control would be something like Bullard. An access control list would also be, I'd say, a technical preventive control. Uh, acceptable use policy would be an example of an operational preventive control. Ideally, you're, you're preventing or you're, and you can make an argument one way or another with a lot of these controls, whether it's preventative or detective, and sometimes they fall into different categories or multiple categories. Okay, So a wall, for example, could be a preventive control, a wall or a fence. You could also ar argue that that's a deterrent too. A wall or a fence would be a deterrent physical control and also a preventive physical control. So you have to make your best judgment on which category it best fits. Now, preventive controls are always placed put in place before an attack or a threat occurs. Then we have detective controls. These are also put in place before an attack occurs. They're designed to detect intrusions, usually uh, man-made in nature. So either hacking attempts or physical intrusions. A physical detective control would be something like a camera or maybe a guard, a drone. Larger data centers will patrol with drones, and that can be very effective. Motion sensors, either infrared or microwave, can be really good detective physical controls. And then technical controls that are detected would be intrusion detection systems, network monitoring tools, things of that nature to help detect when there's unauthorized access. Pretty self-explanatory with detective. Corrective controls. This is, think about fixing something. So these are used to restore functions, to fix a problem that has happened during uh, an intrusion or during a hacking attempt or maybe an environmental threat. So a good example of a physical corrective control in the form of, uh, to combat floods would be something like a sump pump, a pump that would pump out excess water that floods a, a section of a building. We don't have to deal with that a lot in uh, cybersecurity, ideally. Ideally, you're not data your data center is not in a floodplain. But an uh, example in cybersecurity would be 
backups. So if we have an attack, we have maybe a ransomware threat, or maybe we have uh, some sort of outage, a loss of integrity, we can restore our data from backups, and the backups should help us restore functionality to a desired state or a known working state. Vulnerability remediation is also corrective in nature. If we identify vulnerabilities through vulnerability scans and then we start patching or remediating those, patch management software can be would be corrective in nature. And the, re, the uh, restorative functions after an incident, so the later part of incident response would also be corrective in nature as well. So those would all be corrective controls. Now directive controls are designed to basically lead or uh, direct individuals or people. It's usually designed to enforce human behavior. So directive controls are designed to basically guide users to do the right thing or a desired outcome. So an acceptable use policy is a great example of a directive control. Uh, that would be an operational directive control. Standard operating procedures would also be operational uh, directive controls. A lot of these are operational controls as well. Signs could be a directive control if you, if you state, like for example, exit lighting. Exit lighting is a great directive control in the event of an emergency. Exit lighting lights up and it guides people to a valid exit to get out of the building in case of an emergency. Uh, any sort of management policies or letters, emails, you know, stating maybe you need to file your TPS reports, that could be a directive control as well. So all of these are directive controls and they're usually aimed towards individuals to guide user behavior. So they're always, well, almost always operational manager, not always, but very often. Deterrents are used to discourage certain behavior. And these usually include, include signs uh, or digital signs, like a warning banner when you log on to a system. If you log on to any classified system or usually any government system, you're presented with a warning banner stating the intended use of the system and what the what this system could be used for, what it can't be used for. And you have to agree to that. It's often called a click-through banner to then log on to the system. That presents the organization the opportunity to um, first off show uh, some sort of legal uh, warning to the individual so they can then you know punish that individual if they do something that's they, they shouldn't be doing with the system and it also is I it's designed to make that person think twice about doing anything illegal on the system you know stating the system is monitored uh, any uh, misuse could come with legal repercussions, fines, jail time, etc. A good example of physical deterrent controls are signs, you know, like this no trespassing sign here. That's commonly put around uh, restricted areas and you can make them, deterrents don't have to be harsh in nature. They can be something like around your data center, just explaining to people who work in the building that this is a data center, this is a restricted area to remind them maybe somebody would get lost or you have a visitor in the building. They have no intention of stealing your data. They just don't know where they're going. So if you have signs around the data center saying it's restricted access, they might realize that they're in the wrong part of the building. So deterrents are designed to discourage certain behavior. Vis visible physical controls like barbed wire, uh, security guards, dogs, those can be deterrents as well if you make them out in the open. So these are all types of deterrents. Now compensating controls, these are used in place of other controls. So if you can't put one type of control in place that's normally used, you can use a compensating control to put something else in place. So a good example is you have, say you have camera coverage around your entire facility and some of your cameras get broken due to wear or tear or maybe there's a big storm. Well, to compensate for that, instead of having just blind spots, you can have guard patrols and guards would regularly patrol your building. They would compensate, they'd be able to uh, view those areas that are normally under video surveillance. So compensating controls can be very helpful there. Guards can feel, I mean, humans are pretty versatile, you know, so they can do a lot of these uh, physical protection 
controls can be accomplished with guards. You have a breach in your fence line, you stay to, stay to guard there. You, know, you have, um, if you normally have an RFID badge logging people in and it breaks, you put a guard there and you have a sign-in sheet for everybody. So that can be pretty helpful. Now, if we talk about the technical side, usually this comes with outdated or legacy devices. So for example, in industrial security, you have oftentimes SCADA systems or industrial control systems used to manage factories and water systems, power plants. Those are usually based on outdated technology or technology that has availability in mind. It's not designed with security in mind. So what you normally do is you would place firewalls, uh, you would do network segmentation to segment those uh, SCADA systems in their own network, and then you would put boundary protections there, you do defense in depth, and you would usually encapsulate any protocols that are normally unsecure with a secure protocol. Maybe you know, you'd use VPNs or you would have some sort of encapsulating, um, like IPsec or some encapsulating protocol to help keep those outdated protocols that don't have any security uh, secure. So for example, like FTP secure would be a good example of a protocol that can be used to secure other protocols. So you'd wanna use those if you're not able to incorporate security in the primary technology. So that's where a comp and control comes in place and it's implemented after an attack occurs. Uh, well, usually you, usually you would say after a outage or some sort of breach, but you can also argue that sometimes you would plan ahead for these types of outages. Usually in the terms of the test, you would think of a comp stain control after the fact, but those are the types of controls that you're gonna to need to know for your CompT exam. And just remember, these are theoretical in nature. When you're working in a cybersecurity job, you don't really think about the controls in this way. You just think about them for what they actually do. So you wouldn't say, okay, this is a compensating control. You might use that, tech, that language, but really this is here to get you to think about or get you to classify these controls in some way. So thanks so much. I hope that was helpful and have a great day.